Uh, yeah, by the way, you can take out your uh, phones now, so if anyone feels like pictures or uh, anything, you can, everything, <laughs> everything is good, you know, uh, making sure everything is good. Once De Dennis runs a collider video in Burbank. Okay. Hey, so. Hello. You good? Good, good. All right, we're good. Hey, right, Frank, you got it recording? Yep. All right, we're good. Cool. Thank you. Oh, that's Oh, I, I'm more than happy to steal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, DJ, um, as we can, uh, first of all, a huge thank you to IMAX and Paramount for letting us do this. Absolutely. Uh, I've said many times how much I love IMAX, and uh, I'm super happy that we have a partnership with them and are able to do these early screenings. Oh, yeah. Um, so let's just jump into like the most basic thing is, uh, how did you get involved in the Triple X franchise? I was uh, working with Vin on a few other projects, and is this working? Oh yeah, it does. yeah. I, just, I thought you had a mic. Like, yeah, yeah. I did. So yeah. I did. No, I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was working with Vin. On, uh, developing a couple things didn't quite work out. Had a big movie at Sony called Vertigo that almost went, and then ultimately he said, "I want to kind of reintroduce Sandra Cage back into into the modern world." And I thought, "Oh, that could be interesting," because uh, I remember liking Rob Cohen's movie a lot because uh, Xander Cage was this rebel. Is working? No, we have a little trouble. Oh, okay. Do we have another mic that we could use like this? I can handle them. Yeah. Do you, can we use that one? You can always repeat the questions. Sorry for being difficult on anyone watching Facebook. How's that? Better? We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we are. We'll just give it a second. So, uh, how's your day going? It's going well. <laughs> it's my birthday. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I knew that, too. I'm so sorry. No, I had a great dinner with the family. Opened up some real fun gifts. And, uh, yeah, it's my birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. 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 Uh, you know what's funny when we're watching this in here? Ooh. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> when we were watching something in here next door, they were doing the QC, I think, on something. Is yeah. it rattling? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, they're showing something loud in there. Yeah, yeah. You know? So let's jump backwards for a second while yeah. we're waiting um, for, for uh, sound. And uh, uh, I want to mention, like, you directed Eagle Eye. That's correct. And so do you feel like now that Eagle Eye, like, because at the time it seemed like it was far fetched. And like now, do you feel like you were just a little bit ahead of the curve? Yeah, no, it's just funny because even when I was uh, first directing that movie, uh, it was a movie Steven Spielberg was going to direct, J.J. Abrams was going to direct, and J.J. did some writing on it. And Steven at the time thought, like, okay, the time is about now. We're almost there. And that was what, you know, eight years ago. And now I feel like, yeah, it's sort of, it's, uh, it was, uh, it was a little more science fiction then than it is now. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, because at the time, I think it was like. It was a little, you know, like it was very science fiction, if yeah. you will. But yeah. now, you know, after Snowden, I feel like, I mean, by the way, I just want to ask the audience a question. Who here has seen Snowden, the movie? Have you all covered up your camera lens now on your laptop, <laughs> like since that movie? Yeah. Because like I was told that before I saw Snowden, people were like, you know, you want to start covering your, your, your lens, on, lens. Your, on your laptop. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, no, just cover it. Yeah, and even, though, even, even back then, the Eagle Eye days, they were talking about how even the mafios, you know, the mafia guys in New Jersey would always take the battery out of their phone because the FBI can tap into your phone at any time if the power is in there. And so you'd always see these guys take the batteries out. And it's I actually was talking to someone in the uh, Department of Defense, and they said, "Absolutely true, absolutely true." Yeah, because I think I think there's something like with uh, Shia even said on Eagle Eye that when he was doing research, and I could be wrong about this, that. They showed him a little dossier of himself there. Like, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but basically, <laughs> at the time, it was 08, he was told that like one out of every five calls was recorded, and he didn't believe it, right. and they played him back a phone call of his from two years ago. They did. That's true. That's true. Let's all think about this for a second. Like, this is, you know, 08. I mean, there's some crazy shit. There's some crazy shit. You know what I mean? I totally want to jump into Triple X. Well, That's also, too, like, oh. also too, if you think about you know, us as filmmakers, the things that we Google and the things that we research when you're making these movies, you... Uh, 
you end up on a lot of lists, I'm sure, in the State Department. Oh, I mean, listen, if you see me on Twitter, I have railed against Trump so hard yeah. that I'm definitely on a list. Yeah, yeah. If you know me on Twitter, I, I am done. Yeah. Like, yeah. done. Finished. You know, if I'm eliminated, it's just my Twitter. Yeah. It's all my tweets. <laughs> you know, like 100%. Uh, so you, you're going to go see this movie again on Friday and not watch the inauguration. That's what I will not be watching the inauguration, <laughs> inauguration in any way, shape, or form. Good, good. Uh, it's, you know, I don't want to get poli uh, political because there might be some people that support, and I respect you. I just don't respect him. Did I say that out loud? Wait. Uh, yes. I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, hold on a second. I'm going to ask all the sounds go up. And Work in progress. Hopefully, sure. Hopefully very soon here. Uh, I, want, I want to do triple X stuff, but yeah. I also want to film it. So it's yeah. kind of like, uh, um, so we can also talk about uh, like just previous films and stuff. Yeah. Are you a fan of extended cuts? Are you a fan of I putting? Think, I think when the when the when there's certain material and certain films, like for example, I wish I had done an extended cut on Salt and Sea, but at the time wasn't thinking of it. And there's certain things and certain scenes that you're really proud of that you love that just didn't make it. And then uh, and then like for example. You know, we'll talk about but this film or, or some oh, other I told, film. I had some questions about your yeah, yeah, yeah. cut. Yeah, yeah, but there's some other things that you just go, no, it just really, everything ended up in there. But there are certain films that I've worked on, uh, particularly like that. I think uh, Salt and Sea was one I wish I had done that on. Um, Disturbia, everything ended up, that we shot ended up in the movie. So it all just depends on the situation. But I'm a fan when it like truly is something the filmmaker wants to put out as opposed to, I think in the Taking Lives, it was like the extended sex scene that uh, Warner Brothers wanted me to put out there. You know, that was more from a marketing standpoint than a filmmaker it up if you want. Uh, It's funny because uh, when you do the extended cut, a lot of filmmakers have told me that that's the version that's on HBO all the time, and that's the one that like they're always airing. It's not like your director's cut, it's whatever what, that right. most recent cut is. Oh, that's interesting, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. This is shit that I'm learning. <laughs> You know, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll throw out something that I've learned about Netflix recently while we're yeah. waiting. Which we're, is, and, we're good. Oh, okay. Okay. let's just jump into uh, what my next thing. Yeah. Uh, so we're back into Triple X. Yes. Triple X yeah. mode. Okay. Anyway, so I was uh, you're asking the question about how I got involved. Exactly. So yeah, Ben and I were developing some things. They didn't quite work out. He wanted to interview Sandra Cage back into sort of the modern the modern cinematic world, and I thought. It could be a good time for this because I like the I like the attitude of Rob Cohn who directed the first film. I like what they did with Xander. He was this sort of rebel, unique individual, very selfish. But I love that he became a patriot. Do you know what I mean? It kind of said to me like that's a really sort of strong, easy, simple, strong message to apply to the character today. And I love that he was just insane. And for me, I hadn't done action really got deep into action in a long time. I thought it would be a great place to sort of get back into the action movie business. Well, one of the things I think that's great about this film is the diverse cast. You've literally taken, like, cherry-picked uh, people from around the world that have a big following, and they're all in this movie, and they all have, you know, a good part. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about whose idea was it to do, do this cast. Well, I think uh, I give credit a lot to Jeff Kirschenbaum, who's a producer, and Joe Roth, and Jeff was over at Universal and was involved in the Fast franchise as an executive. But when we started to develop the script, we decided too that it would be great in order to sort of expand the Triple X franchise. First was to get Vin to understand that we wanted to do this because the first movie was very Xander centric and really about Xander. But we decided if we made the Triple X agency global instead of just being this American agency, they were dealing with stuff all over the world and who would Gibbons, Sam Jackson's character, have to bring in in order to fill the void that Xander had? Who would he bring in? So it just kind of like, you know, we started, you know, we, we got Donnie Yen, but like, what if it's Jackie Chan or Donnie Yen? Or, so we started thinking that way. And then I had um, seen Ruby Rose and sort of been fascinated by her because she was the, the closest thing to the Angelina Jolie that I worked with years ago. And I was just like enamored by her. So we wrote a character for her. And then I had seen an audition that Vin had done uh, with um, Deepika at the, a couple years back for a different movie that someone had just sent to me. And I thought, God, that would be great if she was Serena. So it just sort of like the combination of sort of like the global marketplace, the world changing, it just felt like the right time to bring everybody in. And it seems like a marketing studio ploy, but it really was like a filmmaker sort of thing from the beginning that we just thought, this is the way the world is. This is the way the world is every day when we go to get coffee. And you know, it's so, so diverse. Why not bring a diverse group in here and, and have fun? And man, it was really blessed when we started to put the entire cast together. Well, the thing that a lot of people, and it just it, it makes no sense to me from the outside, is at the studio level, is that representation matters. It's really important. 
And when you have people from around the world in like a big Hollywood movie, you, I mean, it seems, it's like a no-brainer. So right. why doesn't it happen more often? I'm not sure. I, I think it's part of the, the fear factor of like, I think we're starting, I think Hollywood is starting obviously to think more global. And I think the, the thing I'm most proud of here, there was a few little memos about, well, let's have Deepika speak with an English accent. And I was like, no, she's gonna speak exactly the way that she talks. And Ruby Rose, what if she did that in America? No, she's gonna be Ruby Rose and she's gonna be Australian. And so we, it, it just sort of becomes, that's just the way it is. It's like, I think we try to homogenize all these movies and take these characters. And for me, the biggest fear I had in this movie was with all these actors and all these great characters, how am I gonna give them each their moment? And if I'm gonna, if they're gonna be worried about accents and doing all that, I wanted their individual personalities to really come out in their character. So I gave them a lot of freedom to inject a lot of themselves into the character. And um, that basically, I think, was sort of the template of, of how we we're gonna jump off and make these characters live. live. Because I, the thing I was most fearful of, I wasn't afraid of Vin and Xander and, and Deepika and Ruby and David the moments. It was the Michael Bisbins. You have Tony Jaa in the movie. You have, you know, you know, you have Donnie Yen and Tony Ja. Come on, it's like, a, you know, there's still there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of, you know, for, there's a lot of Americans who will not understand the significance of this. Right. But in Asia, this is a really effing big deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from the Unbox series and Tony Ja and watching him fight, and then Johnny Yen, you know, from Ip Man One, Ip Man Two, Ip Man Three, just a phenomenal, phenomenal, gifted uh, actor. And and to be able to have both of them in the same film for me was just. Uh, Kind of mind blowing because you sort of watch from a distance and you admire how how amazing they are and um, and again Tony Jaa is a great example of if you've seen any of his films and he's usually very serious you know very serious unbuck very stuff he is the the biggest clown that you'll ever meet in your entire life and if you see you know when all that stuff that talent's doing is really Tony Jaa being Tony Jaa and that that was a, an example of of letting someone just be who they are and embracing their culture and. We called him our spiritual leader every day. He would kind of give us a little prayer and take us through. And Donnie Yen, as you can tell, is a very serious, driven guy, and that's exactly what Zhang is. But at the same time, it was important for Donnie that the opposite of Ip Man, that he would be someone, Zhang was going to be someone who was going to be really electric, really on fire, not be reactive, but be proactive. Uh, I'm going to bring up something that, uh, this is going to be a maybe question, yes. let's see how this plays. I've, I've seen Vin work up close. Yes. I've seen Vin on good days, and I've seen Vin on bad days. Uh, what was it like collaborating with Vin? Because by the way, you, you can't say what I'm going to say, which, which I won't, but yeah. he, he can be difficult. Yeah, he can be difficult, but uh, I think what I, when you do your homework and you know you're going to work with somebody, what I always find is whenever, the, whenever there's a reputation of someone that might be difficult because they want it to be good, is I like to build as much time in pre-production and spend that much time with them because I think what happens, and maybe in Vin's case or other cases in the past, where if you don't have a relationship with the filmmaker and there you are on day one setting up shots and doing things and they're not in sync with what you want to do, they kind of have sit back and say, well, wait a minute. So I made sure to spend six weeks with him in pre-production. I was there when he was training on the skateboard was there when he was doing some of that skiing in the jungle and training and always being there. So I, I made it a point to be there. So we had a really good relationship up front. And so we didn't have any of the problems that there might have been in the past because there was a filmmaker bond and a filmmaker trust. And the best thing about having a cast like this is that these people are used to being number one on the call sheet in their country all over the place is they're very competitive. And they all push each other, you know, as friendly as they are. Well, if Donnie's doing that, I'm going to do that, or Vin's doing this, then Ruby's going to do this. So I use that to my advantage as a filmmaker that they all wanted to, to do, they all wanted, they were all competitive and wanted to push themselves. So I didn't have any of the issues with Vin that I've heard in the past. And I think those issues in fairness to him might be because the filmmaker and the, and the lead actor are not the same. You, you absolutely could be right. When Vin's not on the call sheet, who's number one? Uh, <laughs> I think I'd have to say Darien, and then I think Deepika, but I mean, they all were number one in a way because, you know, every day you went to work and you go, oh, by the way, I get Sam Jackson and Neymar today. Oh, and as you guys know now, oh, I get Ice Cube tomorrow. So it was really fun for me to kind of really prepare uh, and go at it. But each day uh, when Vin wasn't there, it was fun because I had this great group and sometimes it's Tony Ja, sometimes it's Michael Bisman. So it depends on the day. There are some crazy, over-the-top action sequences in this film. Was there anything in pre-production you were like, 
yeah, this is even over the top for us. Like, we cannot <laughs> touch this. There was a few things that didn't end up in the movie that were even further uh, over the top. So what we tried to do with these outrageous stunts were still ground them in reality. Uh, so the skiing you see in the jungle without snow, there's a group in, uh, up in Portland called Sweetgrass Productions. It was the first time they'd ever witnessed what I called jungle jib skiing. Uh, so I contacted them. I'm like, okay, how do you guys do this? Uh, so we figured that out. Robbie Madison is an amazing, you know, the evil Cleveland of our time. And I saw him do this thing uh, where he was riding, a, uh, it's called Pipe Dream, about riding a motorcycle in the tube of a wave. And so I saw Robbie almost ride a motorcycle in the tube of the wave and watched all that. So I was like, we can get motorcycles on the water. So we just started pushing it, you know, a zero G gravity fight with a group of people is always something you wanted to do. So. There was a few things that didn't make it, but we try to ground everything in somewhat of a reality. So even though it's really outrageous, it's still within the realm of, of, of possibility. Uh, the movie is like 100 minutes, 95, or something. I think with credits at the end, we ended up being like an hour and 46 minutes or something. Sure, yeah. so how long was your first cut? The first cut was two hours and four minutes. Uh, and was that stuff that was it like stuff that you cut out or you just tightened scenes? It was tightening, mostly tightening. There's really not a scene that ended up on the floor except for something up front with Vin and, um, and his girlfriend um, in that first village in the, in, in the Dominican Republic. There's a little bit of a backstory thing, but we realized we didn't really need that to explain Xander's character. So that was the only little segment, but it was really tightening, tightening, tightening. And when you have action sequences like this and you go to the, 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 you know, the, it takes a long time to shoot them and you kind of see them in the long form and then you start to shape, 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 shape. And there's, as you can tell, there's so much inner cutting by the time you get to, you know, by the time you get to reel five and reel six, the, towards the end of the movie, the inner cuts are so quick that um, there was so many, so much moving around and juxtaposing to see what would work out best. Uh, what camera did you use and why? Uh, we used the Arri Alexa mostly, and then we had some crash cams. We had little Sony cams. I had a little Black Magic that I carry around that I would stick for some of the some of the crashing. So, um, but but it was really the Arri Alexa because I just always find that this is the second film now that I've shot that was just all digital, and there's something about the way that camera behaves and the way that it feels and, and moves that it still feels the closest to film. Uh, to me, at least with the, with the, with the interaction. And then the color spacing is really good. Um, but there's, you know, I, I was having this conversation with someone the other day, like in our job, you know, you think as a, as a filmmaker, you're, you're aspiring to make another movie, you want to make other movies. And whenever I used to hear that film roll through the camera, that little purring sound, I used to know that like everything was all right in the world, you know, and now I don't hear that sound anymore. So it's always a little bit troublesome. Yeah, but you also get to see your dailies like immediately. Well, yeah, that's good. But there's also there's also something, there's always that nervous moment of going to dailies that next morning and hoping that you got it or seeing if it was exposed properly. Or, and there's always, that was something magical about that, as nerve-wracking as it, as it was. Now, you pretty much know what you did as you're going. But you know, you're not alone, though, because I think everyone shoots with the Aria Alexa, uh, or that's the popular camera. Yeah, it seems so. I mean, there's some people that like the red, and they like certain things, but there's something about the Alexa that just seems to be one of those things. And having done some commercials, uh, it, I'm always playing with a commercial. I might shoot one commercial on a red just to see what it's like and how we're feeling about it. So, But it's always, to me, it's always going back to the Alexa. I'm going to switch subjects completely and say I recently saw the Dunkirk footage in all IMAX. You know, the, the yes. full screen, yes. it's not your movie, obviously, right. it's Mr. Nolan, yeah. but I'm in love with the IMAX format. Uh, do you have any thoughts in the future? Because the, the Russos are going to shoot the Avengers in all IMAX. Well, no, I mean, it's amazing, particularly what you guys saw here tonight. When you see the, you know, the, the 3D laser in the IMAX, and you look at the projectors and you're looking at something which I would imagine is 50% brighter than your normal theater experience and you're have a you know a dynamic a color range that's huge and your blacks are so black and there's details in the shadows and even when I got in here even the whites that were blossoming out in the 2K were like there was details in the white it was just so amazing to, to this was the very last uh, process this IMAX process for me I wish it was first because you could see how beautiful your movie can really look and then that coming from that and seeing that sound and, and the laser projector and like seeing the details and the tattoo and it was for me Having been with this movie for a year, finishing here, you know, three and a half weeks ago, whenever I finished, it was really, it, it was exhilarating because the future of cinema is really here. It, it was, uh, it's, it's exciting to see. I would love uh, to know what my next movie might be, but to shoot the certain sequences, at least some of it in the IMAX. And 
uh, particularly here, I think the zero G would have been fantastic and, and some of the stuff in the water too as well. Well, speaking of projection though, uh, you mentioned laser. We, we saw it here in laser projection and it's like, it's a revolution. Oh, it is a revolution. Yeah. I mean, it, like I said, it's like having going through the process and going through the 2K and going through all the different formats to come here and finish and finally see that and, and realize like this is the way you wish the whole world can see your movie. Um, it's probably a little bit overwhelming at first because when I, when I first got in this room, I was not looking at anything that I was supposed to be looking at because uh, I was so excited about the detail I was getting all over the place. Yeah, if you live in the LA area, the Hollywood Highland TLC Chinese, Chinese yeah. is the jaw-dropping laser yes. projection. Yeah. Yeah. And like, is there one in Burbank as well? Or? City, Walk. City Walk as well? Yeah, City Walk. Uh, yeah, I just saw uh, uh, Rogue One and film there. Oh, wow. So they have a projector. I mean, it's all a little Easter egg thing for people. Uh, I think that Mr. Nolan watches his dailies at the City Walk. Hence the reason why there's a film projector there right now okay. because of Dunkirk. Okay. That's just a little inside info. Um, so, <laughs> so I want to ask you about two of things real quick. There was rumors, and I don't know if it's true or not, that you were linked to G.I. Joe 3. Am I wrong? Am I right? Well, before I started this movie, I had a couple meetings with Dwayne uh, or I in the studio about what could happen with G.I. Joe. And what I think there's a, there's a, the franchise has been fairly successful, but there's something about it that's just not fully, fully clicking. I'll and tell so, you what it is. Yeah. It's G.I. Joe meets Transformers. Go on. Well, yeah, but they're not ready to do that yet, right? right. No, I, know, not, I know, I know, I know. But that's exactly what they should do, but they're not ready to do that because, in right. fact, the script that I was developing that the two words sort of collided at the end, and when the studio read it, they're like, "We're not ready to do this yet." <laughs> I, I, I always thought that like at the end of the last GI Joe, it should have been. Uh, uh, I mean, the last Transformers, like you get to the end of the credits, and, and the Easter egg scene would have been: there's a CNN on the TV, you see the Transformers, the camera pulls out, and Dwayne standing there with other Joes, being like. You know, at some point we need to deal with that. <laughs> Fade to black. That's a good, that's a very similar reverse type ending that I would have had to GI Joe and, and the Transformers. But yeah, I think I they will eventually collide those two worlds, and it's probably when Mr. Bay decides like he's done with Transformers and he's sure. gonna he's gonna he's he gonna said that a lot. He did say that a lot. Well, every movie he's like, "This is my last one." Yeah, yeah. But you know, but they're like, let's see, one billion, two billion, three billion. Look, a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't realize though, like. You, you know this as a filmmaker, there's not too many opportunities to play in that sandbox with that budget and those effects and everything. No, and it seems to be getting less, and, there's less and less opportunities because of the, you know, the tentpole movies, there's only so many and there's only so many people to trust. So yeah, you get to, get to get to go out and play like that the way he does, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Did you come close? So G.I. Joe came close for you? Or it it like came close, but I think what the studio was trying to do was sort of reassess it. And so now they're back to the drawing board and, you know, we'll, we'll be talking again about it. But they, they want, they're, you know, it's a, it's a valuable franchise. They just, you know, not that they didn't get it right. They just want to really get it right and see if they can push it to the next level. So what happened with the, another movie I, I saw is Selling Time? Selling Time is a movie I was developing with Will Smith over at Fox that it was a really, really great concept, uh, and then it ultimately became tough to sort of lift the ending. It's always been sort of an Act Three problem about everything coming together. So we're still working on Act Three, hoping that we can, uh, hoping that we can kick it in. But I, I have a, a film that I'm working on now uh, with a producer named Dylan Sellers. It's called God Is a Bullet, which is a Boston Tram novel, which is very, very close to kind of, I would say, going back to what I did in the Salton Sea with two really strong characters and a really cool relationship in a really fucked up situation, but there's something really beautiful about the way everything kind of folds there. Well, the interesting part of the industry now is the mid-range is basically dead. It's like, yes. you can get money for a super low budget or the mega budget, that's but that, the, the, the 40 million to 120, that's just dead. Yeah, no, because it's, no, it's all, I think it's really attributed to how high marketing costs are. Because if you make a movie for $5 million and they love the movie as Blue House does at Universal, then they'll decide to, to put $32 million into marketing it. And so if you're making a $40 million movie and you're putting $30 million in the marketing, as opposed to when you have a tentpole or a franchise, the studio will back you 100%. So I think it's, it's attributed to the marketing costs that that mid-range movie, um, though I, probably should, I wonder what hidden figures cost. Because I mean, that's probably... A, you know, that's a very good question. Yeah, because that might be the type of movie that can still fall within the 30s and 40s and still... Well, Warner Brothers makes a lot of $35 million movies or $40 million. I think, like, Fist Fight, if that's Warner Brothers, that's probably yeah. a $35 million. Right. You know, right. Like, they still have that, right. but... You, you 
you hit the nail on the head with marketing costs. Yeah, I think mean, it's marketing costs. It's just, you know, and, and, and the studios don't know how to market. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's more difficult for them to market a movie that's a little different or maybe a little special because the machine is moving. You know, it's about all the media buy that they bought ahead of time and all the competition and all these dates that are slotted. I mean, it's moving quickly and marketing costs are, are skyrocketing. Well, I use the example of, uh, there's a great romantic comedy that came out of Sundance a few years ago called Sleeping With Other People. Oh, yeah. And Jason Sudeikis, Alison Brie, if you haven't seen it, it's yeah. ridiculously funny. And in the 90s, or early 2000s, that's a wide release. Yes. yes. I think it hit four theaters and did VOD. Right. Like, and, but that's a movie that's a great film, yeah. but the marketing cost to, to, to get it out there, yeah. But the good news is with what we have today, well, the good news is not so much from a financial standpoint, but that movie will live forever. And if people go out and see that now, then the word of mouth can still spread. People will see it, whether it's on Netflix or Amazon. Uh, so what we're doing now, even though some of those smaller movies aren't gonna get maybe the, the releases they had years ago, but they are gonna live forever. You know, there's, there's something cool about knowing that people will discover. I did a little movie called Standing Up, which we made for a million and a half dollars. It's just something I had to do. Uh, after one of the things where I operated the camera, I did it. It sold to Netflix, and you know, not many people saw it, but the people that do really, you know, I saw, I get some of the greatest gratification and letters from that from people who are seeing it on Netflix or some other way. Uh, I heard this Netflix is uh, pretty popular. I heard it's popular. Yeah, it's it, good, it could work. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have a DVD and you send it back. And it's exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you the nail. Yeah, right. Uh, Every time I talk to a filmmaker, they talk about in the editing room that there is one sequence that they always go back to that they're never happy with, and it's when they finally have to turn it in, they just let it up and go. Which was it in Triple X? Believe it or not, in Triple X, well, I shouldn't say believe it or not, maybe, it was the, the intercutting of the traffic fight with Vin and Donnie, intercut with Deepika running and Tony Ja, all those different moving pieces and what was happening in the traffic. Uh, the juxtaposition of all that was something we found late in, in, the, in, the, in the film's editing life. And so always thinking like, you know, we, I didn't settle on it, but it was like, I felt like, and you feel like that in some of the, if I just spent a little more time with it, I just, I didn't want to let it go at that moment, but I had to let it go. Uh, who do you invite, who do you invite to your very early friends and family screenings? Uh, two friends that are really, really, really good besides friends and family, but uh, I try to get Frank Darabont, who's a dear friend of mine. He's not talented at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, not talented at all. And then another good friend of mine who's really talented uh, is John Lee Hancock. And we're really good friends. We've been friends forever. And what I love about them is they understand filmmaking, the directors, the writers, and they understand what you have up there and suggestions that they make are within the boundaries of what can help make your movie better as opposed to, oh, I wish there was another character that uh, did this or did that. So I really, really value them. And, and I'm always honored to be one of the first guys in, in, in their screenings to give them things. So those are the two that I always make sure I get to one or two of the screenings because I trust them so much. I want to make sure there's a few people that can ask questions. I've, I've yeah. kind of barreled through time. Yeah, yeah. I apologize uh, for getting that from her right there. <laughs> um, uh, right there. I think I, well, we should repeat the question. Uh, was there any was there any talk about filming an IMAX? Uh, uh, I, let's, any talk about filming an IMAX? Yeah, there was early talk about it because I, I you know I think par partly for me it was one of those things. This movie came together so quickly because it had to get done before Vin had to get to go to the Fast uh, series that I had some discussions about it early on, but they weren't. They were like, I'm not sure, we can't do it. Is it gonna be fast enough? What sequence are you gonna do? So giving more time, I would have definitely approached it and done it that way. But it, I was glad to be able to sort of, you know, to make that conversion and then to kind of come over here and do it. But I, you know, if, I, if I'm fortunate enough to do it again and this movie performs and I wanna do another one, I would definitely say there's, there's two or three sequences I would wanna pinpoint and shoot my mind. That water scene, man, if that expanded on that whole frame. Can you imagine that? Yeah, that would've been fantastic. Yeah, good call. Uh, what was it? Right there. Um, you have the great like uh, character who's all about DJ, and, and you had a great Snapchat joke. What other things to kind of make it modern? Did like just fell through the cracks? Um, I don't know what fell through the cracks, but again, all of those little things and the, and the Roy making the Snapchat thing. It's just sort of one of those things where this was a this was so this movie was so much fun to make that like 
even in the ending when we were fucking around, I don't, I don't know if you noticed when Neymar is sitting there and his card comes up and it says, you know, thinks he's being recruited for the Avengers. That was just something I just put up there in the editing room for fun. And we were just laughing every time. And then we finally like, let's go screen it that way and just see what happens. So those are the things that we just kind of played with. But, you know, we try to just stay as current. And when you have, you know, Chris Wu, who's like the super cool dude in China, and you have Nina Dober, I always ask them because, look, I'm, you know, I'm 50 years old plus now. Um, what, you know, what can they bring and what's hip and how that works? And, and having a young editorial staff always keeps me sharp and getting cool things. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Well, hold on one second. We got, we got a wrap. I want to make sure there's anyone. We can spend some time. Who did their best stunts? Well, I mean, Vin was really, really good with like riding the board, long board and some of that skiing stuff he wanted to do, which was really insane because if you know how you ski without snow, it's, it's, it's completely insane. I mean, we build these ramps that we kind of put a synthetic snow on and these guys were just launching themselves in the jungle and you just watch them go and you watch them go and you go, he's not gonna hit his mat, he's way past the woods. <laughs> and you just watch him hit a tree, you're like you're getting a guy out of a tree. So those skiers were insane, I mean, insane, scary. Um, but I think overall, I mean, Vin was really great, but I, I will tell you, I learned so much fighting, do, shooting a Donnie Yen fight, that I, it was an education. I went to like film school watching Donnie Yen and for a guy who's 53 years old, getting close to 54, he's in such phenomenal shape. And to watch him work uh, was pretty amazing. So I'd say between it would be between Donnie and Vin. Donnie's having a pretty good month or two. Yeah, yeah. I heard he's in another little art house movie. Uh, <laughs> People haven't seen Rogue One. And he's also in that, you know, uh, the blind person. Yeah. Um, uh, real quick though, uh, because uh, I, you've traveled the world recently to promote the movie. I mean, literally all over the place. Do you know what country you're in right now? Yeah, no, I know where I am. I know I'm in Playa del Rey, and you know, I know I shot Eagle Eye right in that Spoos Cruz uh, staying right back there. But no, we've been traveling and it's so much fun to, you know, to go to, to go to Mumbai, India with Deepika and to see how revered she is there. And we're going to China and I went to London and went to Mexico City. Um, you know, it's a, it's a global, it's a, it's a ever shrinking world and it's, it's a global cinema. Uh, now and so it's it's interesting for me in this part of my career to see how vital it is to to take the crew out there and to go and and to show love to each of these territories. Did you do you feel like you're a musician now when you visit these countries? Because I've done like set visits before yeah. where I fly in, I do the set visit, and I leave that night or the next day. I, I see the hotel, mm -hmm. and then people think it's all glamorous, but it's like I, I don't see anything. No, I mean I mean. Oh, yeah, it's still a great gig. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to right. say, I'll never want to complain because I'm so blessed. It's an amazing job. But there are days like, you know, last week where you don't really know what hotel room you're in. So when you wake out of bed and you're going to find the bathroom, you walk into the closet. You know, there's always things like that where you're just like, you just, you can't get your body oriented enough. But um, no, it's, it's interesting. But when you travel on a promotional tour, you do travel in a way where they do kind of take care of you a little, a little more than perhaps if you and I were just going to get down to Mexico or something. I, I, I completely get it. Okay, a few last things. Yeah, I'm fine. Do you have a lot of like, adversity in the film? Um, does that sort of motivate you out of your scenes when you're in film? Because you're not sure, you know, it's a feature project, you're not really sure everything. You know, is it, there are a lot of smart scenes, but there's still dress, like, things that can happen in that portray women coming up? Well, I think that... How are you going to portray women coming up? Yeah. For the... the <laughs> yeah, no way. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think I'm very proud of how we portrayed the women in this film. Yes, they all dress sexy, but at the same time, my lean actor is also sitting there with no shirt and like walking around. So I understand what you're saying. Um, but I think being the father of, of two younger girls, um, it was really important to me in a weird way to sneak into this really machismo franchise, really strong women. And when I was bringing that up to Vin, he was really up for it and was really game. And when you have Ruby and you have Deepika, and uh, Nina, Nina's in this film is interesting in her own way. She's not an action star, but Becky is sort of the, the techie who can, you know. Um, so it's important. But I mean, even even watching Rogue One, it just dawned on me like this is so cool that like it's the female that's leading and turn lead, and it's it's just the way it just should be. And it's just eventually, hopefully, we won't be have we won't have to ask this question in like five years because it's just to me it do it doesn't matter. I mean, I treated Deepika and Ruby the same way I treated Vin. And, it was really important that, that we wanted Serena to be the female version of Xander so that when they first have their meeting and they face off and he has the knife and she has the gun and they all exchange, that literally they're looking at each other, that they're completely equal. 
Um, and we had our we had our some of the girls in here that were a part of Xander's journey on the way up, but the women that are are in the movie and part of the movie are just as vital, if not as vital, as everybody else. You're, yeah. you're also taking on three women this weekend at the box office with hidden figures. That's true. That's true. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> just throwing that out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I would bet on our women in a fight. <laughs> I'm gonna also agree with you on that one, yes. 100%. Uh, yeah. He was very collaborative. And I, Donnie Yen, how collaborative was he? He was very collaborative in this, and and you're really, it's really make a really good point. For example, in in a, in a, I allowed Donnie obviously to be part of it in the rehearsals. We rehearsed these fights on the weekends, and what's really interesting for me, Donnie was really most interested in who is the stuntman that's going to be taking my kick, because the way that he reacts, or if he sells it too soon, or if he overacts. It literally could be my leg is not my leg might be at full extension at its most powerful point, and this stuntman's already falling over. So you're never going to cut to that. You're never going to see my leg in full extension. And it was really eye-opening to me. I was like, you're absolutely right. So there's kicks that we would stop right before the impact, and the stuntman would react and certain things. So he was really involved. And then I would cut little sequences together. Head of the editor every night cut them together, and I just kind of showed Donnie because believe it or not, it waited up. I have to slow him down sometimes, yeah. you know, because he's so fast. Yeah. So he was very involved and very collaborative. And like I said, I felt like I went to Donnie in film school, which was really cool. And I didn't have to pay for it. Uh, how long was your shooting schedule in this as compared to your other films? This was a 68 day shooting schedule with, um, we had 23 days of second unit, which I directed 13 of the, of the 23 days of second unit. So it was really tight. I mean, did you, wait, did you go to second unit after the first unit wrapped, or you were doing it at the well, same time? Well, we shot in the Dominican Republic. We went on the weekend, so I would shoot Saturday, Sunday, and then I go to the next shoot Saturday, Sunday. Because last time Vin was with the second unit because we wanted to integrate him into the stunts. Um, but believe it or not, like this movie only cost eighty-five million dollars, which for what you saw, I think is pretty remarkable, and that's part of the magic of this movie. That usually movies like this cost one twenty-five, one thirty. But um, we were really disciplined, and that comes a lot from working with, when I was working with Spielberg about shooting what you need and only what you need, and we did a lot of that in this movie. Uh, well, how, how did your shooting schedule compare to, say, Eagle Eye? Eagle Eye, I think we ended up shooting 71 days, um, and the second unit on Eagle Eye might have been like 23 days or 22 days because Brian uh, Smurfs, who did all that amazing car stuff for me, had, had quite a bit of time. And what about Disturbia? Disturbia, we shot Disturbia in 32 days. That makes no sense. <laughs> well, I think about it, right? We shot in 32 days and the movie cost $14 million. Uh, okay, I, I, I see that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wait, is there any other questions? Oh wait, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so kind of like on a serious note, I guess. Oh, yay, he's yeah. in my hand. Yeah. Um, kind of on a serious note, I guess. Um, so what drew you to casting Nina? Nina, right? Mm -hmm. Um, was it more because her character was more in honor because of Michael Roof's character, or was it just you wrote her and that's just how it was on, like, just originally? Well, we we had, we had written her in a way to be sort of, that, that character is the cue of our franchise, yeah. right? And so we wrote her pretty broad and pretty funny because we thought that might be a way to kind of sort of get away and Michael, you know, pay respect to him. but. Um, what was interesting about Nina was when I was meeting her for the first time, I went to the casting director and I was like, you know, Serena's already cast, like, what's Nina doing out there? And she's like, oh no, she's coming in for Becky. I'm like, Nina's coming in for Becky? And they're like, no, no, you've got to see this. You have to see this. And so to me, that was a complete surprise because I had never really met Nina before. And when she came in and read for Becky, she had me rolling over. I mean, I was in stitches. Um, and so I just never really imagined her to be Becky. And so as as um, as we got closer and she wanted to do it, we started then to write a little bit to cater for her. But it was really we just wanted to have fun with that character. The, it was we, you know it's our cue character. We just wanted to have fun with it. Nina brought it to a whole other level. That, that's something that the movie I think does really well is that it's just it's and pardon me for saying it. It's like stupid fun. Yeah. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Well, let's put it this way. Half the time, like whenever I was the bad guy, I said was like. 
can you guys stop fucking around and stop laughing? We have to work. It's like two o'clock. You know, they literally, I kid you not. Like, you know, people say this all the time. These guys really loved each other. They were just having a blast because who had a day off tomorrow? Let's go out tonight. Who had a day off there? Let's go. It's so literally, but they were just so close. And, and Tony Collette, who we haven't talked about, is the funniest of them all because, you know, when Tony blows a take, which she does very rarely, the profanity that comes out of that woman's mouth is priceless. <laughs> I, I was going to ask, uh, how, who ruined the most takes and why? It was actually, I think, I think Tony Collette might have ruined the most takes just because you saw she had the most sort of dialogue and stuff, and just kind of like trying to get it going in one. And and when she lost it, it was just great. And um, there's one other thing, like Ruby, Deepika is such a pro and so graceful and so so just so handles herself so brilliantly, but there's something that Ruby had on her. Like Ruby can say the stupidest thing and Deepika would just boil, you know, just fall on the floor and start laughing. You know, I was like, I felt like a school teacher. Deepika, take a deep breath, the sun's setting, don't listen to Ruby, Ruby, shut up. Um, <laughs> You know, this is come back up here, you know, the camera and Russell Carpenter sweating as the sun's sinking, you know, but they just had so much fun. And so it's stupid fun. And we had stupid fun making the movie. So that was, we thought if we can have the audience have as much fun watching it as we had making it, then that would be, we'd be successful. Uh, any other questions? Can you talk about the idea of bringing back Ice Cube? Was that early in the development process? Or we we wanted to bring back the question oh, is uh, and by the way i'm fine talking about it because paramount has put it in marketing yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh whose idea was it to bring back ice cube was it like an early decision you guys made or was it later on that you were developing the movie it was an early decision we made to say what can we do to acknowledge the second movie which so many people have sort of dismissed in a way and also pay respect to him in a way that he can come in and sort of save the day and when he comes in and we go, X takes care of his own and we do that. We gave him and Xander a history through Gibbons and we wanted to say like, how can we pay homage to that second movie, acknowledge that it exists and give Cube the due that he needs? And so it, we had the idea and there was a couple different versions written, but as we started shooting, it became more clear when he should come into this movie and how he should come into this movie and how he and Xander should sort of interact at that point. So it evolved, we had the idea initially but what you saw today evolved even as we were shooting. We came up with it about halfway through. What's funny is when you, uh, I don't want to talk spe too much specifically about it, but when you, uh, I'm getting the look from over there, by the way. When you, uh, that, that's called the Steve Wrap It Up signal. Yeah, right, right. Um, uh, when, you sh when, you, when you shot that sequence, when you first see it in the movie, it's almost like, at, at first I'm like, oh, they weren't in the same room together. Like he was shooting this on different days, but eventually you pay it off with a, a wide shot. Oh yeah, when we go back over the shoulder. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, they were all there in that, that, that great uh, old uh, power station in Toronto. But yeah, because when you first see him and we're kind of going up on a crane shot, we're kind of pushing up and he's making those fires. But then there's a, a nice tie-in shot from back over his shoulder that kind of looks down at the triple the X game. Well, one of the things that people realize, or I'm sure everyone realizes, when you're shooting an action sequence, that's where the money's going because it just takes so long to film. Uh, but I've been surprised watching in person is just how slow it is to film action. It takes forever. So talk a little bit about, you have a lot of action in this movie. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were able to do it at a cost. How the F do you film so much action and keep that cost down? Well, a lot of it has to do with rehearsals and, and trying to get like, for example, the zero G fight and Donnie's fight in the airplane and Vin on the most is really rehearsing and having the stunt team each what i did on this film which worked out really well because there's only so many people that are crazy or stupid enough to ski in the jungle without snow so we had that group coordinate that section and we had robbie madison who led us our, our motorcycles on the ocean and there's probably six or seven bikes still sitting on the bottom of the atlantic ocean right now um so we had him lead that so what it was there's almost like a team leader in each of these stunts that was really practicing and sending me video and showing me what could be done. And so it's a lot of that preparation. And um, once we got to the gunplay with the two girls and Deepika and Ruby and the guns and everyone doing that stuff, we had rehearsed all those sections for each person and each character. So once we got in there, it was just about kind of loading it up and, and me putting the cameras in the right spot. I, I obviously have to ask you the, the question that I'm sure everyone wants to know, which is assuming this is a hit, and everything goes well, do you already have like little glimmers of ideas for another one? Yeah, we do, we do, because we have this group now, we, we can see them and they're, they're tangible and they're real characters and now it's not just on paper anymore, so knowing what we'd want to do with Ruby and Deepika and Vin and Donnie, we have a really good idea of what we can potentially do and we have a pretty cool storyline 
that would pay homage to kind of a good old 70s movie that I love, and I won't tell you right now, but Walter Hill directed it. Um, and so there's an idea we have about what to do with the triple X team and, and, and how to make that work. Well, I think for you though, you're, you're casting these people to play these parts, and nowadays when anyone is cast in anything, you're no longer signing a one picture deal. For something like this, everyone has to sign a multi-picture contract. How tricky is that when you're casting? Uh, it's pretty tricky because I think, you know, people want to know, okay, they're excited to be in the film. They understand that you're kind of relaunching or launching this franchise. Um, and so it's really, it's kind of a tough thing because you have to negotiate, well, not me, the legal has to negotiate what the price would be for the next movie. And uh, so, you know, as a director, you always kind of turn a deaf ear to that, like, wait, how much? Um, but um, so, yeah, that's the most difficult part for the, the, the studio and um, the legal is to, you have to set that price for the next movie and you do get them to commit to at least two movies. Well, the other thing I've heard is that when you're negotiating the price, you're also negotiating your significance in their shooting schedule in the future, which is something that I don't think anyone reports on. No, but... that's a great that's a great thing because I will tell you the most difficult part of this movie when I got this dream cast together was like, oh, Chris Wu has to be back in China next week, so oh, we can't shoot that. Okay, Donnie Yen has got to go back for Rogue One reshoots. Okay. Um, what am I shooting tomorrow? Like, literally, it became like, with all these people, and Ruby's gotta go do this, and, and so, because you have such high profile characters and actors, they have all these other obligations, they're finishing other movies, the shooting schedule on this was turned around, like, in a way that, you know, if an AD, if an AD just turned that in at the AFI, he would have not, he would have not passed his class, because this is the worst shooting schedule I've ever seen. It's interesting because I think Vin learned a lot on the Fast franchise because they have, you know, like 10 stars and it's a, a very similar thing. You're just like, how, oh, what, what, what the? Yeah, they have big stars. Yeah, but I mean, it's a, that kind of, you know, yeah. tricky kind of thing. Um, well, I'm going to do one more thing because she's going to kill me. Yeah. Uh, does anyone have, well, we actually, well, these are going to be the last two right yeah. here. Hey, Jeff, uh, this is a, you use 3D really well in this movie. This is some of the best 3D I've ever seen in like an action movie. Oh, great. Um, I was wondering, like, from the beginning, did you have a plan to, like, make it 3D, or was it kind of like something they integrated along the way? Because it seems like you planned it. Yeah. Got to repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, he's giving you a mad compliment on the 3D, yeah. and so how did you plan the 3D? Well, you know, knowing that it was going to be in 3D converted eventually, uh, I went and had a meeting with the production designer, John Billington, and talked about depth, you know, because what happens is, have, this is my first 3D film, and I said I didn't want the sets, I didn't want to play the gimmick of 3D, but I wanted to see how can we immerse the audience into the action. And it's sort of like, you know, you, you, I hate to use this, but like you look at what Steven did in Private Ryan when the storming of the beat, it was the first time like really in cinema that I felt like, oh my God, I'm on that boat. There's no way I'm gonna make it on top of that hill. I'm just gonna quit, someone shoot me right now. And so I wanted to say, how do we, how can I have a little bit of control, not in a gimmicky way of things flying at you, but to put the audience into that. So we talked about having extra depth on sets. Russell Carpenter talked about lighting things that he might not have lit deep in the background. And then once the conversion was made, I went in and met with Corey, our, our stereographer, and said, basically, Corey, like, I want to be able to have a lingo with you because I'm not good in 3D about our negative and our positive and depth. Let's take the background here so that I, I want to learn. I want to learn. So we kind of developed the lingo early on in some of the tests. And then I kind of sat through it and just sort of went you know, shot by, believe it or not, you go shot by shot. It just takes forever. And really took the care to go shot by shot. And I know there might be some other filmmakers that are like, great, let someone else do that. But I really wanted to do it because it was my first experience. And so I felt like the combination of the design on the set, the wider lenses that we used. Um, and again, in fairness, there's so, the, the action cuts are so quick that every one of those shots, when you see what happens in 3D in the conversion, as you know, they, they send it overseas somewhere and everyone takes every element and separates those elements out in every single shot. So I can say, great, let's bring these cameras forward, let's go positive on, on Vin, and so it was really good. And the one thing not to, that I learned that I didn't really understand about 3D was depending on where your depth perception was and where you had your eye on the cut prior, you can't all of a sudden say, oh, because this car's coming at us, I want, I want this car to be out here in the positive. You had to really mind the audience's eye and know where their depth was in the screen so that the very next cut wasn't so jarring 
that the depth of the eyes. So it was it was fun, but I really appreciate that compliment. It means a lot because I spent a lot of painstaking time watching it all. The, the key thing I learned, and uh, basically what you just said is, uh, 3D in post production is very possible. It just you need the time to do it. Yes. Yeah. And we have the time. So they, uh, I think you had a question. Oh, wow. Thank you. And me and my husband, we're from Bakersfield, so I hit the pond with my buddy who lives on Pike, and he had a director or art artist or anybody there that he appreciate their work. We actually did artwork for them. I did a painting for you. And oh, so wow. I was curious if when you were done, if you wanted to bring it up to me and you can sign my copy. Absolutely. And, and, and it's her birthday, no less. <laughs> I'd be honored. That's so sweet. Thank you so much. I think that's going to be where we actually end the night, unless someone has an urgent thing, but let's just end it there because it's a really good ending. Uh, I'm going to say thank you to you for letting us see the movie early. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your And a huge thank you to IMAX and uh, Paramount for letting us show the film early. Uh, anyone watching, uh, go see it in IMAX. It's go see it in IMAX. Definitely. It's definitely in the format. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for attending tonight. Thank you. Oh, wait.